Hi, this is Peter Friedrich, and today we're speaking with Dr. Tanzila Mukhtar about the Kashmir issue. And Tanzila, um, can you tell us, you're from Kashmir, correct? Yes. Okay. And can you tell me and tell us briefly about yourself? All right. Hi, Peter. Hi, everyone. So I'm Dr. Tanzila Mukhtar. I am, um, recently completed my PhD in neurobiology. So I'm a neurobiologist by training. I've been based in Switzerland for the last six and a half years. And uh, I have been out of Kashmir for almost 14 years now. So I have actually lived in different parts of the world. I had a chance to also be in England. Now I'm in Switzerland. And yeah, in coming days, I'll be moving to San Francisco. Um, yeah, that's more or less about me. And uh, yeah, I am from Kashmir. And uh, basically, I can tell you how I'm feeling about what's going on in Kashmir at the moment. But let's start with um, how it was growing up in Kashmir. Kashmir has been in conflict for 70 years. So it was growing, I mean, it was very difficult while we were growing up as well. So I did my schooling until 16, I was in Kashmir. So I did my schooling in Kashmir. And every day it was like, you wouldn't know what's going to happen the next moment. So there were obviously a few years where, you know, things were a bit more peaceful than the rest. But recently, if some of you have been following the news, things haven't been very nice. Uh, the issue right now is that um, we have a very extreme right-wing government in India and uh, they have tried to actually revoke a special status Kashmir had, Jammu and Kashmir, the state of Jammu and Kashmir had, and they have tried to revoke it uh, in a very unconstitutional way by brute force, by putting the entire population of Kashmir under a very strict curfew, under strict restrictions. And it's been actually nine or 10 days that I haven't spoken to my parents. So I'm someone who's very connected to my family. And I, <laughs> it's been nine, 10 days that I haven't been able to speak to my mom. I don't really know about their whereabouts. Denzilla, how often do you speak to your parents? Every day, sometimes twice a day. So every morning I start my day. So I work in a lab and I basically go to work. I go for a coffee and over coffee, I speak to my mom every day. So if I don't call my mom at 9, 30, 10 Central European time, she feels that something is not right with me. So she gets, either sends me a WhatsApp text to ask me if I'm fine. So, you know, it, it's just not one way, it's a two way thing. So I decided to actually speak to you, Peter, because I think mostly the Indian media, it's corrupt. So the narrative that's actually in the mainstream media is totally corrupt because they tell you a one side story. What is, I what decided is story, to. What is the story that they're telling you? They tell you that everything is perfectly fine in Kashmir. How can everything be fine when people are not allowed to go out, even on a big festival? Muslims. It's a Kashmir is a Muslim majority. On E, the people were not allowed to even offer prayers in many mosques. How is it even possible everything is normal? They expect us to live under curfew. They expect my parents, who are basically in their mid-60s, to not go out at all. I mean, what about the food? Do they have food stocked up? Because that's what... They advised initially, they advised all Kashmiris that, you know, they should stock up food. So basically what India has done, it's not just these nine, 10 days of extreme curfew. But before that, there was a lot of psychological warfare they inflicted on people. So they told people that nothing was wrong. Everything was perfectly fine. But they actually deployed many more troops. So Kashmir is the highest militarized zone in the world. Plus, they got more troops in Kashmir and claimed that there were, you know, some eminent ter terror attacks or something, which was all bullshit because nothing like that was, I mean, has happened in these days. So they evacuated their tourists. So we have a famous pilgrimage. It's called as Amarnath Yatra. So they actually evacuated their own Indian tourists from the state, from Kashmir. They evacuated their students, Indian students who were studying in our colleges and medical and engineering colleges. They evacuated them selectively and they basically left Kashmiris there and then on them. So basically, Kashmiris are now, there are medicines available. We know nothing. It's, it's the biggest human rights violation. I have, I mean, see, I know Kashmir has been put under curfew many more times, but this time it just feels way more extreme because the problem is that they have been doing it by brute force. They have, there's so much army and so much security forces, so many of them on the roads. So whoever is going to Kashmir, they are cut off from the world. The media is not allowed to report. And if some media, for example, BBC reported something recently, people accuse them that they were just, you know, making things up. 
Yeah, so, if, I can, if I can interject, Tenzilla, what BBC reported was uh, just a few days ago that there was a massive uh, rally, a protest uh, yep. against the curfew, that there were uh, hundreds of people out on the streets protesting, mm -hmm. and that the security forces responded by firing tear gas and possibly even bullets uh, yep. at the protesters. India subsequently uh, denied the rally even occurred, even though there was video footage of it. Mm -hmm. So this is the problem. So, you know, the mainstream media, their own media, they don't report anything. And whoever reports, they negate everything. So basically, I mean, are we supposed to believe that there are no human rights violations happening? I mean, what are we supposed to believe? What is the world supposed to believe? It's all a sham. I mean, whatever they have done, they have, okay, they had to take, they had to pass a certain bill in the parliament. They have a majority at the moment in the upper house, in the lower house. They somehow got the bill signed by the president or whatever, whatever they had to do. They could have consulted the people of Kashmir, but they didn't do that. They put everybody in Kashmir under strict curfew. It was by brute force. They actually revoked our special status, which was promised to us by the then prime minister. So this issue is not just about, you know, our special status, but this is the humiliation it has caused us. I will give you an example. I spoke to my, first of all, I have not been able to speak to my parents. I spoke to my mother-in-law today. She stays in a different district than Srinagar. So I'm from Srinagar. My uh, husband and his family, they're from a different district. Just to make a call, they have to go to a police station, which is a few kilometers away from home. And then they have to wait for a couple of hours in a queue to make a call or we are supposed to call them. So somehow they have to call one of us because they can't make international calls from that number. So they have to call one of us, like say my brother-in-law based in Delhi or wherever. And then he texts us and then we can call. So this is what they did we have so many Kashmiris and I have so many friends who are scientists and you know our qualifications, everything. They have reduced us to nothing. This is humiliating for us. Our parents have to go to police stations to make calls. Now they say that they have go <laughs> they're going to set up 300 telephone booths for millions of people, 300 booths. It's a joke. I, I don't know. I really don't know what to do. I mean, to be honest, I'll tell you. I decided that I wanted to speak to you and not just to you. I'm actually going out in Switzerland, in Basel. I'm giving out pamphlets about, you know, whatever is happening in Kashmir. I'm speaking to people because people need to know the true color of India. India is not a secular country. I am sorry. No, it's not. I have few okay, friends who are India. liberals. Tanzila, you say India is not a secular country. Why do you say that? What do you, what do you, let me ask you, let me ask you, what do you feel like is the motivation behind this latest action by the by the Modi led by the BJP led government in in Delhi uh, towards Kashmir. Why are they doing it? So first of all, it was on their manifesto during these elections. It was on their manifesto that they are going to solve or resolve the Kashmir issue. So the Kashmir issue, you know, it's deep rooted. Actually, Kashmiris do not want to be with India. I was somebody who was actually a liberal person. I was pro-progress. I actually supported India. I thought that maybe, you know, Kashmir was going to progress with India, but they have stabbed me in the back and many others because, sorry, you cannot put my parents, my family and the entire population under a curfew like this. So first of all, this is what they're trying to prove, the manifesto right, that they have done something for Kashmir. Second, it seems, because nobody knows what their plan is, to be honest, but we can only presume that, you know, what they're trying to do is diffuse the population diffuse the population. What they want is they want to get people from outside to settle and create these settlements in Kashmir. From outside, they get people and they kind of diffuse the Kashmiri population. Second is Kashmir is a Muslim majority state. There are many other Indian states that actually hold a special status or so. We have had a special status. They wanted to revoke this. Why were they not concerned about any other state? Because Kashmir is a Muslim majority state. Are we being targeted because of the religion? And we know that BJP is a right-wing party. They want, they want India to be like a Hindu Rashtra or something. So, I mean, whatever India projects itself as a secular country, it's not secular at all. Because we seriously don't understand that, you know, what was the requirement of doing it in such a haste? You know, basically, this removal of this article could have been done at ease. You know, they could have actually consulted 
people from Kashmir last year, and it's not just, it's not something recent, it has happened from last year. Last year, we had a state government in place, and it was a coalition government of People's Democratic Party with Bharatiya Janata Party, BJP. BJP pulled out its support, and the government fell. Then, the, because PDP, the People's Democratic Party, is a regional party, they wanted to make a coalition with the National Conference, another regional party, or uh, in uh, Congress. You know, they wanted to make a government. And that time, they put the governor's rule, basically. And eventually, they dissolved the governor's, dissolved the assembly. So what happened was right now, um, we, even right now, we have a governor's, we have governor's rule in Kashmir. And even then, I mean, they couldn't form the government. So we have no elected representatives at the moment. So and the and deal, this, was, this was when they put this governor's rule in place and they dissolved the assembly. Exactly. A democratically elected government in place in Jammu and Kashmir. Yes. And Delhi stepped in and yanked away that government forcibly yes. and said, and said, we're going to rule the state, which then it was a state uh, yes. from Delhi. Yes. And then when the assembly, the state assembly was dissolved, then we had the governor. Then there were the main elections, the central elections, right? Um, that time, every state had the elections, but Jammu and Kashmir did not have any elections. So we were expecting that even, you know, Jammu and Kashmir will have elections, but they didn't have elections. Mm -hmm. So we didn't understand that. They continued that governor's rule. And now this is the plan, right? You know, the manifesto was possibly to create so much of chaos because what has actually happened was not just this nine, 10 days of uh, curfew. I'll tell you how it started because... You said that you don't know much about the issue, but I'll tell you how it started. They first started deploying many troops. So we already have like 900,000 troops and they de were deploying more. Hmm. And then uh, they told... 50,000 50, more in the past couple of yes. weeks. Yeah. So basically they deployed more troops. So everyone was kind of scared in Kashmir because obviously nobody knew why were they doing that. So first we thought that maybe there's some war or something with Pakistan or at some one of the frontiers. So we didn't know. But the government kept assuring people that nothing was going to be wrong. Everything was under control. And then they started evacuating the tourists and the students. Then the bureaucrats, the state bureaucrats, like they started, um, or the district you know, uh, commissioners, they started issuing advisories for the local public that they should stock up medicine, they should stock up food. So obviously the people were in a state of chaos because nobody knew what's going on. So everyone was totally scared what's going on. So they're not evacuating Kashmiris, but only Indians. And then after a few days, like one or two days, because there was so much chaos. I mean, even if the governor was asked what's going on, his reply was like, okay, I know I will tell you until evening today, nothing is going to happen. Tomorrow I can't guarantee. He is somebody who's the head of a fucking, I'm sorry for the language, he's the head of the state. How can you actually behave like this with people? There are kids, there are people who need medicines, there are kids who need milk. It's crazy there. They have no value for human life. And you know why it hurts me? Because I have lived abroad for so many years and I see people, people cannot take a decision even to make a footpath without consulting people. Without consulting the residents, the government or the council cannot make, the canton cannot make a decision of making a footpath or you know a road or a renovation of a road. And there, you are basically actually you know suppressing people like this this is extreme oppression because honestly i mean i told you that you know it is humiliating for me i used to believe in india but not anymore i will never believe in india and the one good thing that it has done this whole incident has done you know i think two weeks back there were different groups of people and some of them were pro india some of them were pro progress in kashmir but this incident the way they have violated our basic human rights, it has unified all of us. And we clearly know that we cannot be happy with India because there is no respect. India doesn't respect us. This is all garbage when they say that, you know, Kashmir is going to progress with India and they are going to do this and this is for uh, progress. No, actually it's not because you look at the you know, mortality rate or you look at the education, you look at everything. Kashmir is doing much better from other states. So what progress are they referring to? We are actually doing better than other states. Why so, have been like so, why has the state been bifurcated? So so then so then that is of course the reason one of the primary reasons that's been offered for this move by the BJP government is that it's in order to bring development to uh, Kashmir. Uh, the implication being that Kashmir the Kashmiris desperately want their state to be developed. But but it sounds like you as a Kashmiri 
And uh, if, if maybe you have some inkling of what your parents who are presently living mm -hmm. in your sphere feel like, that you're not you're not crying out for the central government to step in and do anything anything to develop the state at the moment. You feel like the state is already in a good position of development. It's it's a well developed state. No, what I mean is that I would first say my priority is the right to the self determination for Kashmiris, and then comes the progress. That is more important. That the state, the central government, should respect us first, and then they can claim that they are going to progress our state. Putting my family or putting everyone in Kashmir under a curfew and telling us they are going to progress. Progress for what? My parents have to go to a police station to make a call and stand in a queue for I don't know for how many hours. I mean, you should see some of the you know <laughs> some of the newspapers are actually reporting. They have these different articles and. People actually have to go for three continuous days to be able to make one call to someone based out, like, you know, outside Kashmir or based outside in the world. It's it's difficult situation in today's world when you have the entire world at the tip of your, like, you know, fingertips. I, how can you imagine that someone has to go to a telephone booth or a police station to make a call? And what have we done for that? There was nothing going on in the last two weeks. Everything was peaceful. I mean, if they should follow the news, was there anything going on? No, it's just a manifesto. This is an election gimmick. They actually <laughs> wanted to pull. They have just made us And you know, rest of Indians, forget some liberals, but rest of Indians are actually enjoying it. They are liking the fact that now Kashmir has been integrated with India. But the government's previous governments always claimed Kashmir is an integral part of India. So what have they integrated? Yeah, that's an excellent point. If we were already with India, if we were already in the state. So, yeah, this entire situation is very grave. I mean, I, I don't really know what else to explain. Growing up in Kashmir was hard enough. But when I, you know, when I moved abroad, I mean, I did not want to move abroad. But the point is, I am a scientist. So research is much better here. I was doing my PhD in Switzerland. But looking back home, I don't know, I feel, or some of us feel that, you know, an entire generation has to sacrifice our careers and everything and maybe just return back to Kashmir and kind of be at the forefront of this movement because this is just getting out of the hand. So, Danzilla, I suppose I already know the answer to this question, but do you believe that Kashmiris have had an opportunity to have their voices heard in determining the solution to Kashmir? I would say not really, not enough. Because if somebody would have really heard our voices, Kashmir issue would have been resolved. It's not been enough. Even right now, we are trying our best to actually be vocal to speak to people and that's why i also decided to speak to you because you know i don't want the only narrative to be played on again and again what the indian media is actually you know constructing you should and many others and for the, from the rest of the world should know what is the story behind from a kashmiri i may not have lived every moment in kashmir but my parents are and every year i go there i see that you know there is no growth in kashmir and no growth not because you know, the government is not doing much or something because it is in a conflict and we need to resolve the conflict first. And you cannot resolve the conflict by putting people under a curfew. Hmm. It just is not done. Yeah, it's not whatever they say. Growth, progress, investment from outside, whatever. Nothing justifies what they have done because what they have done is gruesome, it's barbaric. They cannot put people under a curfew, under a communication blackout for, I don't know, nine, 10 days. And we don't even know when the phones will be restored. I mean, if they are going to be restored after 15th of August, which is supposedly the Independence Day of India, I don't really think they should celebrate it. But, you know, why are they installing so many booths, 300 booths? Do you really think the governor or whoever is in charge is going to invest so much? I think it's an indefinite time. The communication blackout is for an indefinite time. We don't really know. What is the future? And it's scary. I don't know. It's a very bad situation in Kashmir. And it's all because of India. I don't know what else to say. What do you think the future looks like for Kashmir? At the moment, very bleak. If this is what it continues like. If India decides to have the same hardliner policy with Kashmir and Kashmiris, I can tell you that they can never win over Kashmiris. 
by being so brutal with them. Nobody can. I mean, come on. They had to be, if they wanted Kashmir to integrate, they had to at least give people a chance to speak back. But to be honest, what they have done, it has opened our eyes. I was a fool. I used to think that in Kashmir has a future with India. I am no. Now I've changed my mind. Whatever they do. No, Kashmir does not have a future with India. I can tell you that. And I can speak for many other people I know. We don't have a future with India. Simply, we need to have a referendum where people get to decide what do they want to do. And most of the people are going to vote for self-determination. They are going to vote for an independent country. Because we are not happy with India. I mean, there's too many violations. Yeah, no, we're not happy with India. Well, I appreciate your time and I appreciate your perspective, your opinions, uh, Dr. Tanjila Mukta. Thank you so much for your time, Pete. It means a lot.